Okay, so once again, hi everyone. I'm Faven Reese. I'm really excited to be giving this talk. Welcome to Rewards versus Punishments, a human-centered approach to reinforcement learning. So a little bit about me, Mackenzie just shared a lot, so I actually don't need to go over this, um, but pretty much I'm a student at University of Maryland College Park, um, really, really interested in ML. I absolutely love it. I've done it through research and some industry experiences so far. Um, previously, I've done novelty detection with JPL and now doing some field crop yield estimation with Harvest. And even further than that, I've gone into natural disasters, learning about how to apply um, ML and um, analyzing activation maps, dimensionality reduction, and then also previously neuroengineering, which is where I'm heading towards for the rest of my graduate career. So I'm really, really interested in how you can apply intelligence, be it artificial intelligence, um, biological intelligence, machine intelligence, for scientific novelty and social good. And so a brief outline of what we're gonna cover today. Um, first is the topic of learning why we learn, what is learning, and then we're also going to talk about reinforcement learning, also RL. We're also going to talk about the human decision-making process, specifically more rewards versus punishments, and a human RL model, and sort of what challenges exist in it, and how can we sort of have more input in how to relate the human or biological system to the actual reinforcement learning model that we implement in machine learning. And throughout the presentation, if you have any questions, feel free to drop it in the chat. Um, I should be able to see that. Okay. So first is learning. Um, learning in this context of sort of reinforcement is an interaction between the agent and an environment. So whenever there is some sort of action, decision, choice, alternative option, et cetera, and any agent has the ability to make that choice within some world, within some objective to achieve X goal, we call that learning. Some reasons why we learn humans in general are when we lack expertise, such as us currently navigating Mars. Um, one of my previous projects, we actually contributed to algorithms that can be used to detect novelties in sort of any bodies or biologically possible bodies found on Mars with the Curiosity rover. Mm -hmm. um, and so also we learn because we lack explainability for certain things. For example, speech recognition. Um, if you wanna sort of understand a different language or say somebody has an impediment, how do you begin to explain what speech is, right? So those are the types of things that we apply learning to. We also use learning to study changes over time. For example, if you look at the computer architecture, going from a very huge system to now being so micro is something that could be on a, an Apple Watch or on your phone or your iPads, et cetera. We want to study why those happen over time and also how to account for possibly future limitations. Lastly, we also learn for adaptability. I think as humans, this is one of the biggest factors. We love adapting and we naturally adapt over time. So things like user biometrics, for example, if you use your finger scan, I currently use that on my laptop to turn it on, to get permission for certain websites and the likes, um, or even you using face ID if you have an iOS system, for, ex for example. And so how do we apply learning to machine learning? Generally, machine learning, the objective of that is to optimize task performance. So given any action, right, when you're given a goal to achieve something, that's a task, and your goal is to make this the best possible way. How do you do this? You apply some algorithms, some mathematical equation, uh, derived formula understanding to basically then um, infer some meaning about that data. And this is done in two facets. So in statistics, we usually do machine learning as inference from a sample, right? You're drawing some conclusion based on whatever mathematical equations you've applied to your data set. In computer science, we're really more focused on these huge algorithms that solve, represent, and evaluate the model. Um, you might be familiar with some of these, like Bayesian inference, for example, and the likes, and all these various types of um, classification versus regression. Um, those are all types of machine learning models that help us sort of use data to answer any type of questions. That question could be actually determining X or Y, or it could be just to understand a pattern, 
right? And in reinforcement and learning sake, it could be to basically select the best course of action. And so now we're gonna talk a little bit more about how machine learning relates to reinforcement learning. <laughs> um, so reinforcement learning, we define this by saying it's learning through interactions. So I previously mentioned that learning, it's basically just interactions in an environment. Reinforcement learning basically just says, I want you to learn even more every time you make an interaction. So like a subset of learning within itself, right? And how you do this is that you maximize the reward signal. So you have this concept of something means a reward to a, to a re um, reinforcement learning model. And your goal is to make this best every time you have a certain state and a certain within, and you have an action within that state, your entire goal is to make sure whatever choice, whatever output results from that, it is the best possible choice. And you continue to build upon that best possible choice until you result in an action that achieves your goal. And so breaking this down into sort of a task format, reinforcement learning is when an agent acts in an environment, it receives feedback, we call that feedback reinforcement, and then you achieve that goal. And I use the double-ended arrow here to show that this is very cyclical, right? When we talk about feedback models, for example, the entire goal is that there is some return um, within each state, right? So sometimes your model is gonna say, um, well, I learned this, and so I'm going to apply what I just learned, take this feedback, take this reinforcement, and go back again and act on the environment or act on a certain state. Learn even more and contribute that weight right and continue to do so until you get that best output before you have the final output so all of these stages within the reinforcement learning task really just happen in subsets of themselves as well um, so it's just it's very much like a domino effect it just goes all the way down and then you go right back up go all the way down an example of reinforcement learning in sort of the real world is when a child or a toddler tries to use electronics Right? If you think about how a child learns to use electronics, they don't really know how to navigate between um, a YouTube video versus an application, but they just make these actions. Right, So they know when the selected content is engaging to them, hence why a child might smile or start laughing when they finally select that content. But that process of getting there, they're not given the actions to get there by themselves. They learn that somehow, maybe by always learning when I click this button, it gets me one step closer. So next time when they come on that iPad, they're going to always click that first button and then try to figure everything else out on their own. So that's a real world example of child electronic usage. Mm -hmm. A similar one is when a toddler is learning to walk, right? Uh, you're not really given or the child is not given exact definitions or exact steps to teach them how to walk. But maybe they learn by crawling first are holding on to an object, and that somehow maximizes their ability to possibly walk, and eventually they achieve that goal of walking. So that's reinforcement learning with an example of a human model. And so now we're gonna talk about reinforcement learning, the actual model um, within a mathematical or statistical format. It's really more about cause and effect. So reinforcement learning really focuses on causality. So we break this down into five steps. First, you have this reinforcement learning agent, right? It's some representation within the model. It's able to observe an input state. So you give it something and it basically can see it. It can sort of almost just receive it and hold it within itself. Then it determines an action. Um, there is some policy within your model that tells it, okay, um, I need you to be able to achieve this goal or perform this task, and I give you this function generic enough, and I want you to keep learning based on this function. So your agent then determines any possible action, right? At this point in time, there is no sort of big understanding or interpretation going on. It's just selecting an action. It performs the action, and then it receives that really key part, the scalar reward, right? Or a, a reinforcement from the environment. This basically tells the model, it says, okay, here is basically some numerical way of measuring how well you just performed. And that information about the reward given for that state, that's recorded. 
and that goes all the way back again to the agent and this repeats as I mentioned. And now some of you might be familiar with the market decision process model, um, MDP. So typically reinforcement learning is actually modeled or represented as an MDP model. So it's that similar format of you have the agent, you have the environment, agent performs action in the environment, you have the states, right? Sort of these um, various layers of interactions, types of interactions, and you get that reward and you just wanna keep making that better. And if you think about humans and how we sort of go through decision making, we follow a very similar approach. So now I'm gonna go over to the human side and talk a little bit more about decision making. Okay, so decision making. Decision making is selecting a course of action among several possibilities. And your goal is to achieve some output. The output, it could be an action or it could be an opinion of choice. So if you're able to comment in the chat, feel free to share any maybe any um, big decisions that you've had to make um, and whether it was an action that you had to result in or an opinion of choice. Right. I think we've all had to do this at some point. I had to make a decision this morning whether I wanted to eat breakfast or not. If you can guess, I did not <laughs> choose breakfast. <laughs> um, so that's just an example of decision making. And so to get there, um, we have to first you identify a problem. Then you identify the decision criteria, which basically allows you to say, here are the things that are required for me to be able to make this decision, right? Here are my tangibles. Then you allocate weight to this criteria. So you prioritize what's really important. So maybe for me to eat breakfast, time is a huge factor compared to what clothes I'm wearing, right? Like maybe my focus is really, if I have a lecture starting at nine and it's 8.50, I don't have the time. So that has a bigger weight than say where I'm currently located within the house because I could always run upstairs or downstairs, et cetera. Once you have this weight, you then have alternatives, right? So you define these possibilities. When I talked about the machine learning, reinforcement learning model before, I mentioned that you have this policy that allows you to make certain decisions, right? These alternatives are the possible actions that your decision function can lead to. So in humans, we basically state this by, I could choose to eat breakfast now, I could choose to eat it later, I could choose to grab a muffin and go, or I could choose to make eggs for breakfast, right? These are all alternatives that still achieve the goal of eating breakfast. Somebody mentioned an example of a decision, a decision to change career. Yeah, Zara, that's a good one, <laughs> right? That is definitely a type of decision where you need to allocate weight to the criteria. Right? Where are you currently located in life? Uh, maybe if you have a partner in life or not, or if you have a lease that you can't uh, possibly break out of, um, your educational background, et cetera. How much have you saved? Um, these are all important criteria to consider. Once you've developed these alternatives, in decision-making, you analyze all the alternatives. Right? There's very different ways to do this. Usually, if you go the sort of management route, Sometimes there are policies where you analyze alternatives, um, all of them holistically before you make a decision, or there are times where you do sort of a restricted, a constrained analysis of alternatives, right? So once you analyze, you then wanna select. So I've considered all the various things, seen which would best align with my decision criteria and the weights, the priorities I've associated with them, and then I implement that best alternative. So maybe if, I'm, if I have only five minutes before my lecture starts and I need to be in class, probably grabbing a muffin is gonna be the best choice as opposed to me going to the kitchen, whipping out a skillet and going through the entire process of actually preparing breakfast, right? And then once that's done, really in decision making, it's not over. Sometimes we stop at implementing, but an also key part is evaluating your decision effectiveness. So now I know whenever I have a five minute constraint, if I'm able to grab a muffin and say that takes only one minute, I say four minutes. Now I have that as my best effective decision for five minutes. But that might not be the best course of action, say if maybe I do have five minutes, but I'm not gonna get any free time for eight more hours. 
right? Then I'm definitely going to feel hungry later. So maybe my decision model needs to be revised so that I have more time to even make the decision. That's why it's so important to decide how effective your decision is. And this is something that reinforcement learning does at every state. It always decides, it always evaluates, it always tells the model, this is how well you performed. And here's why you need to consider that so you can keep making the best course of action. So there's some sort of self-correction policy there. And it'd be really cool if humans had this too. So we're gonna talk about that a little bit more. So when humans, we're gonna talk about rewards. Reward in humans is understood as something that is given in return of a service, effort, or achievement. And usually this has a positive connotation. So you might know some examples of rewards. Um, this could be you gaining a gift certificate, a trophy, an award, you know, I think the Forbes, the Forbes um, 30 Under 30 was just published a couple days ago. Um, amazing, amazing accomplishments. And one of my mentors was on there. So shout out to Dr. Kerner. Um, amazing work. So that's human reward, right? Something given in return of a service. And it's positive. In reinforcement learning or in machine learning, actually, reward is neutral. There is no understanding of what reward is meaning there is no interpretability directly of what something is supposed to be positive or not, right? So all that reward is, reward is what you maximize. That's all the machine knows. It just knows, I want to keep making this numerical signal bigger because that's what makes agent behavior better. So that's the difference between rewards and human versus machines. As humans, we have this ability to interpret what reward means assign it to some sort of belief, more culture, et cetera, norm, but in reinforcement learning, that does not exist, right? We give meaning to the model as humans. And then when we talk about punishments, for human punishment, this is usually a penalty, right? A negative connotation. So it's a penalty given and returned to a service, effort, or offense. Likewise, in, re in reinforcement learning punishment, and it's what you minimize. So once again, there is that neutral connotation here. There is no interpretability in reinforcement learning of something being bad, right? There's just an understanding of what to reduce. So at any given point in time, there is representation of all possible actions or decisions within the model. All your model does, your reinforcement learning model does, it just chooses which to represent more of or less of, right? Rather than saying, this is bad, I will not include it. This is good, I will include it. Your reinforcement learning model cannot do that. So it's really important for us to think about when we interpret reinforcement learning models with our human understanding of rewards versus machines, this is not directly translatable to what actual machine learning model does. And so how do we sort of start bridging that gap? How do we look at how decisions are made biologically within the nervous system, within the brain? And how do we tie that to what the computer is able to do and how we interpret and develop more on those models? So the human oral model um, is what I'm really excited to talk about. Basically, it starts with this sort of understanding of everyone has their own version of the truth. Right, so there is so much variability. There is so many differences, minute, big, you name it, within everyone's perception. In fact, I'm sure, as some of you know, a couple of years ago, there was the challenge of, is this dress blue or gold? There have been all these sort of questions about, you know, if I look at the sky, am I seeing a reflection? I mean, there, there are all sorts of understanding of what the truth is, right? And even sometimes with friends, I look at a certain dress or whatever have you, and I think it's a certain color, and they don't even see the same color. So with that realization, how do you begin to develop a model or interpret a model when there is variation in every possible understanding? So this is where we come to intrinsic reward versus extrinsic reward. So as humans, we have intrinsic reward. This means we have self-motivation. We have curiosity, we have a desire to do things, to learn things, to be better, just because we want to. That's intrinsic, it fulfills us within ourselves. 
Machine learning models, like reinforcement learning, do not have intrinsic reward. You can teach it intrinsic reward, right? You can imbue that as a human within your model, but naturally speaking, it's all extrinsic, meaning there is some external definition of what reward is, and all your machine learning, reinforcement learning model does, it takes whatever it's come out with, that output, and it says, compare that to that external definition, and that must be the reward, right? So that's way different than how humans just behave and how humans are. So how do you even bridge that? We then talk about a couple of implementations. So going into the brain and sort of understanding more of the neuroscience background, there was this concept of Pavlovian conditioning, right? And even going back to something called operant conditioning, which is where learning is error driven. Now, if you've done machine learning, this sounds familiar to you, right? Error-driven learning is something that we implement all the time. If you calculate an L2 loss, for example, within your model, you're always trying to sort of minimize um, at any given point in time the error that your model learns so you can best optimize your model performance, right? Be it in training, be it in validation, be it in testing, et cetera. Pavlovian conditioning was very similar. So we'd wanted to teach animal models. If I give you this task, you know, rats, if I tell you to feed at this certain time, where are you when it's time to feed, right? Are you actually feeding? Are you, where are you located? Um, are you there automatically when it's time for feeding? Um, how far are you away from the cage? There's all these definitions of what error could be. And the goal for Pavlovian conditioning was to basically use error to minimize the mistakes, the punishments through learning. Then you have another understanding of instrumental conditioning which is where you learn policy to obtain, to obtain rewards. This is a lot more similar to the reinforcement learning model, right? So it's sort of, you've defined the state, you've defined this decision function, and by learning more of it, you're always able to achieve something that maximizes your model's performance. And then lastly, we have the prediction error hypothesis. This really was very key in understanding human decision making. Basically, it states that dopamine within the brain, which is basically able to help you determine and maximize a feeling of satisfaction, pleasure, happiness, etc. Basically, what you want to see as reward, right? You can look at the production of it as it accepting some reward within the human system. It's able to encode a temporal difference, reward prediction error. So over time, right, within these different states and different actions, frequencies, as things happen, as decisions are being made, it's able to then basically reward the prediction error. So if this error is small, then I'm going to, say, produce more dopamine, as opposed to when the error is large, then I'm not going to produce as much dopamine. So maybe sometimes when you make a bad decision, right, and you feel bad, Right, that state of feeling bad might result from less production of dopamine versus when you make a decision, say, to help somebody else, something that is intrinsic, it's self-motivating, or you have a euphoric moment when you debug something after like eight hours of being on Stack Overflow, right? Then you have this great moment of feeling so great um, and you want to you do it all over again, right? It's almost addictive. You want to keep maximizing. This is exactly what reinforcement learning stems from. It is that ability to really encode some prediction and understand the difference in the error of the prediction and then try to maximize it, try to get better at it. So that, <laughs> yeah, Zara, I see your comment too. Yeah, no, I literally spent so much time with Stack Overflow. It is, it's hilarious. But yeah, so that is basically an overview of human RL model and what rewards versus punishments are. And this is really important because a major challenge right now is in understanding biases. And so when you have a bias as a human or your machine learning model or your algorithm, the foundational principle of whatever you're using has a bias, this then always affects your policy, your decision function. It affects the environments that you create and it always affects your agent behavior and how it can understand and interpret reward. So it becomes very, very important for us as scientists, engineers, analysts, visualization experts, you name it, to really understand how to develop sort of fair systems 
fully representational systems, holistic systems that have variability, that have different components, diversity in them, like the human system within itself, right? Everyone has their own version of truth. So we need to be able to define a reinforcement learning model that is able to encapsulate to some degree variability. So not fully representational model, perhaps, not X to Y exactly, right? But maybe correlational models, um, translational models that just better allow for learning in between the error making itself. And so that's a quick overview of the human RL model, rewards versus punishments. And now I will take any questions. Thank you so much. Thank you so much Taylor, for your talk. And thank you everyone who joined today. So Favor will be here for any questions. Um, if you want to post those in the chat. Go Terps, yeah, good. <laughs> oh, nice. Oh, yes, Olga asked, what kinds of applications exist in RL? Oh, nice. Hi, Sandra, UMD alum. Love to see it. Okay, to answer Olga's question, there are so many representations of RL. Um, actually, in one of my current projects with the Battle Data Lab um, at UMD, we're implementing the market decision process model to define visualization recommendation systems. So basically the entire goal is while an analyst is able to say type up code snippets to create some visualization, we want to define what the best course of action would be to predict what code to write next, right? To recommend code to build that visualization. That's an example of how you use reinforcement learning. Um, so through recording and going through a user study of many different types of ways that these people are able to code visualizations, you then sort of store that and you start to attribute reward, of course, with your goal being the visualization equaling, say, bar chart, right, or pie chart or whatever have you. That's your goal. And through that process, maybe if you hit a certain state of um, if you're able to get the line to show up, if you're able to get one bar to show up, if you're able to define variables within your code, that is defined as a numerical reward. And you keep building on that to finally encode your visualization. Another example of reinforcement learning is the traffic controller system. So this has previously been applied to basically measure delay in vehicles at traffic stops. And so you learn then how to optimize when the traffic controller says go versus wait um, versus stop etc. I hope that helps, Olga. Feel free to ask any more, any more questions. You're welcome. <laughs> yes, yes, it is. I love reinforcement learning. I especially love it because of its similarity with the human sort of brain or mind, and that is my passion. Um, it's always been my passion, so I, I love understanding just the similarities between humans and all the machine learning cool things that we do. It's all a representation of each other, so great connection there. Would you have some play projects? Some play projects, hmm. I can, I can send those to you. So there are a couple of Kaggle, if you're familiar with Kaggle, um, they usually do like a lot of competitions, et cetera, and they provide data sets on Kaggle. I can find a couple of Kaggle um, sort of projects and send those over to you. So if you follow me on LinkedIn, I, I can reach out to you that way. Otherwise, I will write my email in the chat as well. So feel free to email me and I can send those to you. Thank you, Susie. Can supervised or unsupervised RL be used together to achieve anything? Oh, Zara, that's a great question. I had almost forgotten to say this. Yeah, so reinforcement learning is actually semi-supervised, right? Meaning you're providing some understanding, which is why I talked about it being extrinsic reward. You provide some understanding of what you want to get to. Um, so fully unsupervised, that would be somewhat, somewhat, 
<laughs> challenging to interpret because to the machine learning model, somehow it always needs to have some check and balance on what it's achieved, right? So there's possibly an implementation there that could be an ensemble method of semi-supervised and just unsupervised in total for reinforcement learning. I haven't found any yet, but there are also different types of I mentioned earlier in decision making, sometimes your output could be an action or it could be an opinion. So similar to machine learning generally, where you have a classification versus a pattern, you can use reinforcement learning to do the same thing. So you could do it maybe just to say, I want to do this, or I just want to give some understanding towards something. That somewhat understanding could be unsupervised versus actually doing an action, which would then be semi-supervised because you need to define what the action would be compared to. I hope that helps. <laughs> You're welcome.